Good morning, guys. So glad to be here with you this morning. So good to be here with you. You know, Pat prayed um, that he's so thankful for us pastors uh, teaching God's Word. I got to tell you, as pastors, we're just so grateful um, for you guys. So this has been one of those weeks for me, and it's been a, a blessing to get ready this morning to spend time with you as we study God's Word together. And I know you feel the same way, that we get to join together with our brothers and study God's Word. I invite you to open up your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, this morning we're starting Paul's second letter to those Thessalonians. Um, as you're turning there, just a little bit of uh, context to get us started. You know, <clears throat> not much time has passed since Paul had written that first letter. This is the same group of people that he wrote to the first time. It's that still that same small but vibrant church in Thessalonica. They were believing in the Lord Jesus. They were proclaiming the Lord Jesus. They were a healthy church. But as you remember, they're not a church without problems. In fact, a lot of the issues that Paul spoke into in that first letter, those issues are still present now. In fact, they've even gotten worse. And so really what Paul's doing in this letter, as he did in the first letter, is to pastorally and theologically address those those problems head on. And if we remember what these problems are, uh, first off, there were still jokers in Thessalonica that were having false teaching. They were teaching the Christians that the day of the Lord, the second coming, had already come, right? Um, but what's more, they've been doing it for so long now, Christians in the church actually started believing that. And there was lots of issues that came from believing that erroneous teaching. And so chapter two, we'll find Paul addresses that head on theologically and pastorally, and he says some deep stuff, and I can't wait to study that together. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, another issue that he addressed was that there was a group of Christians in this church who I think probably because of that false teaching that Jesus had already come, uh, scholars call them a, a group of loafers. Um, essentially, they quit working, they quit providing for themselves, they quit providing for their families, and they were mooching over all the other Christians in that church, they were thinking to themselves, well, if Jesus has already come and we missed the boat on that, I mean, what's the point of doing anything? And so they were loafing about. And so Paul rebukes them and really shapes the church about how to think of work in these end times in which we're living. And he'll address that in, in chapter 3. But in chapter 1, his main aim, and I think really his main aim in the entirety of the letter, is to strengthen these Christians to encourage them because they were facing unremittent persecution. Remember, when Paul was there in the flesh, Paul was being persecuted. He got run out of town. The Christians, not so much yet, that, that early church. It was Paul who was being persecuted. But by the time he wrote that first letter, they were experiencing persecution. And that's gotten more intense since that first letter from both the Jews and the Romans. If this persecution didn't include outright exile for themselves and their families or even martyrdom, it certainly included economic oppression and isolation, all because they claimed Jesus as Christ and not Caesar. They were being persecuted greatly. They were experiencing severe hardships. And so in light of all of that, Paul's main aim was to get them ready for those things. And that's really the main aim for any pastor or it should be, to get the flock ready to experience suffering in this life. Jesus promised us that we will experience persecution and suffering as we are, live in this already not yet um, epoch of biblical history. As we await the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will experience those things. And these Christians were experiencing those things in a mighty way. And so Paul is trying to, to get them ready, to gird their loins, to trust in God's sovereignty. No matter what's happening out in the world or what's happening to the church, to trust in God's sovereignty. He's in charge. He's in control. For them to live in light of who God is and what he is doing and what he will do in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul was a dying man preaching to dying men, helping them to live well and in well, all for the glory of Jesus Christ. And really, is that not the bottom line of why we're doing this? Studying God's word that we might live well and in well, all for the glory of Jesus Christ? Of course it is. And so that's what Paul's main motivation is. And in these first four verses, he gives us a wonderful key on how to do that. We must cultivate a heart of thanksgiving. So let's read this together, starting in verse 1 
of 2 Thessalonians. God's Word says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you and the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all of your persecutions and in the afflictions that you're enduring. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I am, again, so grateful for every single one of my brothers in this room. I'm grateful and thankful to you for the faith that you've given them, for the faith that you've given me. Those are gifts. And Lord, we pray that you would foster that faith, that you would grant us the gift of increasing faith, that we might rest in you and proclaim you in all circumstances. We love you, God. We pray these things in the blessed name of the risen King Jesus. Amen. It's amazing that Thanksgiving is already upon us. It's starting to feel like fall outside. Uh, but Thanksgiving's upon us, which among other things, of course, we're going to have delicious food, which I'm very grateful for. I've been dieting since September, and I'm really looking forward to some fried turkey, I can tell you that much. But in this time of the year, we often think through those things that we are thankful for, right? And that's a lot of our family traditions. We gather around the table or at nighttime, we discuss with our family members, hey, what is it that we are thankful for? And of course, we are thankful for a lot of things. We're thankful that it's football season, if your football team's doing well. Um, we're thankful for, I'm thankful for the Grizzlies. You know, the Grizzlies are doing well. I love watching Ja play. Uh, a gentleman this morning told me that he's just grateful that he's ambulatory this morning, that he's, <laughs> that he's up and breathing. And that's a great thing to be thankful for. I know some of us aren't very grateful this morning. We might be going through things that, you know, are just hard, you know, seasons of deprivation. And if I were to give you the task to sit down and write out those things that you're thankful for, you might be hard to think through. What is it that I'm thankful for? Nevertheless, it's a great exercise for us to think about what is it? What is it that I'm thankful for? That's really what Paul poses to us this morning in these first four verses. Now, there's two things I find very peculiar about these four verses. Two things. First off, Paul is an extremely thankful man. If you just look at these verses, if you read any of his letters, it just jumps off the page. Paul was an extremely thankful person. I think that's strange because on the surface, Paul had a miserable life. He really did. I mean, when he became a Christian, I mean, on the surface, if you're just looking at the contents of his life, I mean, it went into the pits. He was persecuted from day one. He was beaten to an inch of his life several times. He experienced calamity, shipwrecks. I mean, who experiences shipwrecks? He had three of them. And people were chasing him. He was being hunted, right? He had a hard knock life, Paul. But the man was thankful. He was overflowing with thanksgiving. What's even more strange is that according to verse 3, he felt he was obligated to be thankful. He felt obligated to be thankful. It wasn't that he just had this spontaneous emotion, oh, gee whiz, I'm grateful. No, no, no. He was obligated to be grateful. And what that means is, even in those seasons when Paul didn't necessarily feel thankful, and we go through seasons where we don't necessarily feel thankful, even during those seasons, Paul cultivated a heart of thanksgiving because for him, it was almost a moral obligation as a Christian to be thankful. In fact, you can look through his letters and in several places, including Colossians 3, and especially 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul says it's a moral imperative for the church to be thankful. What does he say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? He says, give thanks. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, not just the happy moments, but, but in all circumstances, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I mean, no one has that oughtness to be thankful these days. I mean, but Paul says, no, this, this is a moral obligation for us as Christians to be thankful. Now, why is that? There's a number of reasons, but I love what John Stott says. This is what he says. It's... It's very profound if you just sit, if you sit and think about it. He says, the noxious weed of pride and its cousins of discontentment and ingratitude, 
the noxious weed of pride, the poisonous weed of pride and its cousins, discontentment and ingratitude, do not grow easily in the soil of a thankful heart. The noxious weed, the poisonous weed of pride and its cousins, discontentment and ingratitude, do not grow easily in the soil of a thankful heart. If you think about it, it were those noxious weeds of pride and ingratitude and discontentment that were at the heart of man's first sin at the fall, right? Adam listened to the voice of the temper, tempter. And he said to himself, you know what, Satan? You know what, serpent? You're right. God is withholding. God is being stingy. I want to be things and do things apart from God's blessing, apart from God's will. At the heart of his sin, at the heart of the fall, was discontentment and ingratitude. And it's those same things that it's at the heart of our fallenness as well. Discontentment and ingratitude is behind every single sin that we commit. Paul says so in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. He says, For although they knew God, they did not honor God or give thanks to Him. The point is, our natural bent, our natural disposition as fallen human beings is discontentment and ingratitude. And it's when we experience seasons of deprivation and trial and suffering and adversity that we especially struggle with those things. In fact, I believe it's one of the great tactics of the evil one, that when we experience these seasons, he whispers to us, does he not? Hey, Barton, God is stingy. He doesn't care about you. If he did care about you, why would he allow you to go through these things? He's preventing all the blessings that could be yours. And as we listen to that tempter, what happens? That ingratitude and that discontentment grows in our heart. And when ingratitude and discontentment grows in our heart, what happens? Well, first off, God is robbed of the honor and glory due his name because we know that we ought to thank God for all things. But when ingratitude and discontentment grows, it robs God of his glory. Secondly, it robs us of our joy. When we focus on, oh man, I don't have this, or, or God has allowed me to go through this, and we dwell on that, what does it do? It robs us of our joy, our immense joy that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, it cripples us in following Jesus faithfully. Because again, behind every single sin is this discontentment and ingratitude. Ah, oh, God didn't bless me. God didn't do this. I'm going to do my own thing. It's for these reasons Paul says gratitude must be at the heart of our Christian life. Because again, as John Stott says, those noxious weeds do not grow easily in the soil of a thankful heart. John Piper, he says it like this. He says gratitude is the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. It's what it means to be created and finite and fallen and redeemed and sustained by the grace of God. Therefore, a heart of thanksgiving, gratitude, is the virtue most worthy of cultivation. So it's a good practice, it's a good discipline for us to think through what is it I am thankful for. And it's even better to, to think through how am I supposed to cultivate a heart of thanksgiving. Paul gives us a great starting place in these first four verses. Two major points. The first thing that he says, if we want to cultivate a heart of thanksgiving, remember your own spiritual reality. If you want to cultivate a heart of thanksgiving, remember your own spiritual reality, believers. I've said this before, and I truly believe it because I experienced it this week. Oftentimes when we go through seasons of deprivation, um, stress or adversity, whatever it might be, oftentimes we can become laser-focused on whatever that problem is. It's hard for us to see, it's almost as if whatever that issue is has become the sum total of our existence and reality. We can't possibly see beyond, we have a hard time seeing beyond the problems that we're dealing with. And, and I was experiencing that week, like this week, like two or three different times. And so this passage was extremely comforting and challenging for me. But in verses one and two, this is what Paul is doing. He, he's inviting us to step back out of our mess. He's inviting us to step back and to remember what is true. Essentially, what Paul is saying, if we just put it in layman's terms, he's saying, count your blessings, these tremendous blessings that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in these first two verses, brothers, he tells us tremendous things. 
that if we count them and remember them, I promise you, they will fill you with a tremendous joy. Three, uh, a couple of things. First off, he says, behold your God. Step back from whatever you're experiencing. Remember true reality. Remember your spiritual reality. Behold your God. If we were to take these two letters that Paul writes to the Thessalonians and place them side by side, all right, and just do a little comparative study, we would notice that the uh, introduction that Paul has in the first couple of verses in both letters are almost exactly identical. Almost. There's one glaring difference. In the first letter, this is how he introduces. He says, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians, this is what he says. He says, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. See that? There's one word difference, but it's a major difference. In that first verse, he says, God, the Father. Now he says, God, our Father. So in that first instance, this is what he's doing. Well, first off, he's drawing attention to this massive Christological statement that, that Jesus is divine, right? And that he does the same thing in the second letter. But in that first instance, this is what he's doing. He, he's drawing attention to the special relationship that Jesus the Son has with God the Father. In that, in that Trinitarian relationship, God is the Father, Jesus is the Son, is the special relationship they've enjoyed for all of eternity. But here... Believers, he is drawing our attention to the special relationship that we have with God. And what Paul is saying, it's not just that God is the Father, he is, but remember, God is also your Father too. And that's so important for us to remember. I mean, it's like in that first letter, Paul is just bringing out the major theological guns and he's reminding us that God is the Father. But here he's remembering that, that these Christians, they're experiencing so much turmoil. There's so much suffering. They're scared. They're lonely. They're isolated. And so here's Paul just wrapping his gentle pastoral arms around these suffering Christians. He goes, remember, it's not just that God is the Father. He is, but he's also your Father too. And he says, remember that. I mean, just think about this practically, folks. I mean, some of us in here had amazing dads. We have amazing dads. Dads that loved us. Dads that told us they loved us. Dads that cared for us. Dads that provided for us. Dads that made sure that we were secured. Dads that reminded us that we were secure, that they were there for us. They would help us. Just amazing fathers. Others of us had the opposite experience. We had bad dads. And just the mere memory of our relationship with them causes deep pain in our hearts. Paul says, whatever category you fall in, know this, that you have a Father in heaven who is matchless. So remember that if you had a good dad, if you have a good dad, he, he is only, only a mere shadow of the perfect Father in heaven that you got. If you had a bad dad who failed you, know this. You have a perfect father in heaven who will never, ever, ever possibly fail you. And so it's almost as if Paul is saying, I know that you're going through some awful things. I am too. And I know that you're going to be tempted to be filled with discouragement and discontentment. Why am I here? But brothers, remember what you got. God is your Father, and by virtue of the Holy Spirit, that spirit of adoption, we now have the ability to call the Creator of the cosmos that intimate name, Abba. That beautiful name that Jesus calls God the Father, Abba, which means Daddy. It's that form of affection. You have that ability. You have that right to call God Abba, the one who holds the universe in his hands. You can trust everything to him because he is your perfect father who is with you, who loves you, who is for you, and will never, ever possibly forsake you. And so just think, I mean, when is the last time, when is the last time in good times or bad times, we just stopped and said to ourselves, it's not just that God is the father but he's my father. Paul says, behold your God and give thanks. Secondly, he says, behold your savior. Two separate times in these first two verses, he gives us this jam-packed theological phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. He says it twice. He only said it once in that first letter. 
It's like he's trying to remind us something because he says it twice here, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I want to do, I just want to think about that one name and those two titles really quickly, what they mean. The Lord. The Lord is a standard name used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which means Yahweh, the name of God. Paul is making that great Christological statement that Jesus is God, the name that is above every name, at the sound of which every knee in heaven on earth and under the earth will bow has been given to Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. I want you to hear this from Colossians chapter 1, the description of Jesus' lordship. Okay, Paul goes into great detail in Colossians chapter 1 describing what it means that Jesus is Lord. This is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15, talking about the preeminence of Christ as Lord. Paul says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him thing, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in this faith. That is his lordship. What Paul is saying here is not just that Jesus is Lord, but he is your Lord. He has done those things for you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, second name, Jesus, the most precious name ever spoken. It's the name that charms our fears. It's the name that reminds us that we cannot be saved apart from him. The angel said to the mother Mary, name your baby boy Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. His people. Brothers, we know the most beautiful name ever spoken in history. And what's more, the owner of that name knows you and loves you personally. Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the equivalent of that word Messiah, God's anointed one. His promised Redeemer, which he promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15, the Redeemer, the one who would vanquish evil, the one who would right every wrong and wipe every tear. Paul is saying, in the midst of strife, in the midst of adversity, remember the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who truly is God, the one by whom and for whom all things were created, the one who governs history, the one who promises to save and redeem and restore his people. Remember that the Lord Jesus Christ has obligated himself to you. He is your Savior. This isn't theoretical. He has saved you. Behold your Savior. Thirdly, behold your status. Brothers, as Christians of the church of Jesus Christ, those who have been restored, rescued, and redeemed, have been brought into his body, we have been given an amazing, an amazing status. What does Paul say? He says the church in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Even though we are in Memphis and even though we're at our tables in Fellowship Hall at Second Presbyterian Church, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are located, situated, united to God in Jesus Christ. He is in you. You are in him. He represents you to the Father in heaven. You are in him. Just think about what we know theologically, what Paul tells us in Ephesians. God, as our Father, set his love upon us before the foundation of the world. We are his beloved children. He set his love upon you before the foundation of the world. So much so that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to be your Savior, to die for your sins. And he sent your spirit in order to unite you to himself. And why did he do that? 
Jesus tells us in John chapter 17, that upper room discourse, so that you and I, little old us, might know and experience and enjoy and thrive in that same loving relationship, intimate fellowship that God the Son has enjoyed with God the Father for all of eternity. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's unbelievable. I like what C.S. Lewis says. He says, we ran away from God in sin, but God in his grace ran after us to bring us back into that divine dance, that royal party, that intimate fellowship that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit has enjoyed for all of eternity. That's how much he loves you. That's your status in the Lord Jesus Christ. So no matter what our circumstances are, really, it doesn't mean that we are flippant about our circumstances, that we ignore them. We're not masochists. But in spite of what our circumstances say or what we feel or what other people say about us, brothers, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are blessed beyond measure. Blessed. You have been adopted into the one royal eternal family of God where you are a co-heir of the Lord Jesus Christ and an heir of God. That's true of you. You are justified. You are saved by the work of Jesus Christ. You are being sanctified. That means you're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And on the day to come, you will be glorified. So truly, being an ungrateful Christian is truly an, an oxymoron. We have so much to be thankful for. But here's the reality. In our fallen condition, it is hard for us to have that posture of thanksgiving. It really is. In fact, so, uh, psychologists say that unlike other emotions like happiness and anger, having an, a heart of gratitude, it, it takes a conscious effort because it does not come to us naturally. We know why, but even psychologists recognize that. As John Piper says, gratitude therefore must be planted. It must be watered. It must be harvested. In other words, it must be cultivated. We must discipline ourselves in counting the tremendous blessings we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know why. God is worthy of our thanksgiving. It's the, it's the natural response of a sinner saved by grace to give thanks to God. He is worthy of it. Secondly, as we count our blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ, it kind of serves as a shield, does it not, to those darts of ingratitude that the tempter launches at us on a daily basis. Oh, Barton, God has sent you. No, he's not. And by remembering all the blessings we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it, help us, it helps us to have right perspective during seasons of adversity and disappointment by helping us to remember what is true. So right now is, you know, election season. Every election season, we're either maybe overjoyed or extremely disappointed. Half the country is, is either rejoicing right now that their guy, their savior almost, got into the office and other people are like, oh man, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. As Christians, we're, of course, we're concerned. We should be. But we also, when we're in our right minds, we can give thanks in all circumstances. Because we know that whoever God allows to be elected, Jesus Christ is the one who's in charge. And he's the one who is governing history. And he's the one who will make earth as it is in heaven. And so we can give thanks in all circumstances, no matter what it is. And so when our friends or our family members or coworkers say, how could you be so excited? Or why aren't you so more excited? Say, because my hope is not in an elephant. Or it's not in a, a donkey. It's in the slain lamb. And it's the slain lamb who has this whole world in his hands, including me. Rejoice, brothers. That's what Paul is saying. That we must count our blessings to behold our God, to behold our Savior and to remember our status. And when we do, we would be filled, filled with thanksgiving. So not only that, there's another thing that he tells us to do. And it's kind of weird. In verses 3 and 4, he says, remember to give thanks for each other. Remember to give thanks for each other. We see this in verses 3 and 4. If Paul only implies in verses 1 and 2 that we ought to step back and remember what is true of us spiritually, 
He explicitly states in verses 3 and 4 through his own model that we are obligated to give thanks for one another. That we're obligated to do so. So essentially what he's saying, please step back, Barton, and remember and notice what God is doing in your, in your own life, but also take note of what God is doing in the life of your brothers at Amen. And give thanks for that. We don't usually do this. So there's three things that we see here in verses 3 and 4 that I think will help us give thanks for each other. The first thing that we see is the content of Paul's prayer of thanksgiving. I'm sure Paul was thankful for a lot of things. He loved these Christians so very much. And I'm sure he was thankful for things they did for him. You know, I'm sure Billy helped him with his tent making business. I'm sure Frank's mom cooked a mean meatloaf that he loved after work. And I'm sure he was thankful for those things. Good things to be thankful for, things I'm sure we would be thankful for. But he mentions only two things right here that he was very thankful for. And this is what he says. We ought to give thanks to God because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. What Paul is saying, in the laundry list of things I can be thankful for, these are the two things I'm going to mention in God's word. Your faith is growing and your love is increasing. I think that's extremely significant. In fact, Ligon Duncan points out this is very significant, very significant because Paul mentions the very two things that Jesus prayed for the church in the upper room on the night that he was betrayed in John chapter 13. When Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. And of course, there was a lot of things to be troubled by. Jesus said, you're going to be persecuted. This world isn't going to go the way that you think it is. You're going to have a hard time. But let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Faith. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So also love one another. Love. Faith and love. Those are the things that Jesus prayed for the church on that last night that he was going to spend with his disciples. And those are the very same things that Paul prayed for us in that first letter to the Thessalonians. So right here, Paul is not only giving thanks that these things were present in the life of these believers, he was giving thank thanks that they were actually growing. He was saying, church, I am so thankful to God because not only do you have faith and you have love and you have hope in your life, but these Christian graces are growing. And as he noticed that in the life of his brothers and his sisters, it caused him to overflow with thanksgiving. Here's just a little side note. I think it's funny. Sometimes the concept of spiritual growth is lost on most people. Most people view things like faith, love, and hope as static issues. Like you either have it or you don't. You know, we've heard it said before, like, Bill, I really wish I had your faith. Like, you know, I wish I had your hairline. It's the same type of thing. I wish I had your waist, you know? It's like it's a genetic endowment faith. Love the same way. You either have it or you don't. These static issues. But the Bible does not speak of love, hope, and faith in that way. It speaks of it in a living relationship. These are things that can grow. And Paul right here is praising God because those things were growing in their life. That's been so challenging for me this week, and it might be challenging for you too. Because are those the things that I am thankful for? Are those the things that I pray for, for my kids, for my friends, for myself? Because it really is. Whatever we're truly grateful for, I think it reveals where our priorities lie. So just think, if you were given the choice to have bad health, and because of that bad health, you've grown in your dependence upon the Lord. What would you say to God? Would you say thank you for this thorn in the flesh? Or would you say, God, how, how could you, how could you, how dare you give me that thorn in the flesh? For our kids, <laughs> if we were told our kid was not going to be a good student wasn't going to be particularly athletic to where we could not live vicariously through their athletic accomplishments. If they weren't going to be very social, if they weren't ever going to get married, if they weren't going to be financially successful, but they were abounding in faith, that they were filled with love, they were zealously loving their neighbors, and they were hoping in the Lord Jesus Christ, hoping against hope. 
what would we say? If we were told that we could be a member of a church, but this church is going to have lousy programs, they weren't going to have delicious breakfasts for Thursday morning Bible studies, their music department had a lot to be desired, they had good preaching, but no Ligon Duncan, no Tim Keller, but their faith was abundant. They were loving their neighbors zealously. Would we say, thank you, God, that I get to be a member of that church, or would we be flipping through the white pages to find for a better church? This church back then, it was not perfect. Far from it. They had damaged people, broken people. They experienced hard things. They struggle with a lot of things. But Paul gave thanks because they were growing in the right things. Is that what we're thankful for? The content of Paul's prayer. The second thing we're going to see is the direction of Paul's prayer. Paul says, we ought to give thanks. It is right for us to do this. We ought to give thanks not to you, to God. In other words, Paul is not saying, Christians, I am so thankful that you are loving and faithful. That's not what he says. He goes, I want to thank God for the work that he's doing in you. After all, it's God who blesses us with faith. It's God who blesses us with love, and he's the one that causes those things to grow. So he is the one that we give thanks. But I do think there's something important for us to learn here. John Stott, in his commentary, he kind of makes a joke of it. He said the command to live out of of giving thanks for each other is most of the time awkward because usually one or two things happen. One, we accidentally slip into congratulating people. You know, it's like, hey, James, thank you for being loving. Good job. You are great at being a loving person. Good job. I was actually, uh, the first time that I ever preached a sermon was in this little church up north, and I was so nervous. And after I got done, I didn't say amen. I said thank you out of fear. <laughs> it's just, I just lost myself and I said, thank you. And everybody said, what? You know, <laughs> and they made fun of me about it. But sometimes we just slip into this thing like it's our work and we congratulate ourselves or others so we can slip into that way. Or we can be so nervous of, of, of puffing up people's ego, we never say anything. And John Stott just says, that's mean to never say anything. So what do we do? Paul offers us a third way. We always give thanks to God. We always give thanks to God. He's the one that's working. However, we let our brothers and sisters know that we're thanking God for them. That's what he does here. He clues them in on this prayer that he's making to God. He did that purposefully. So an example would be, Todd, I just want you to know I am so thankful to God for the gifts that he's given you. For those teaching gifts, for those counseling gifts, for those mentorship gifts, you have blessed my soul. God has blessed me through you. But even more than those gifts, I just want you to say, I just want to say that I'm thankful to God for the faith that he's given you because it's increased my faith. Watching you believe Jesus during these difficult things that you're going through, it has increased my faith. I just wanted you to know that. Has anybody ever said anything like that to you before? It's amazing because not only does it direct your attention back towards God for for you to give thanks to God for these things, but it encourages you because someone else just noticed Jesus in your life and they praise God, but they let you know about it. It's, It's the Pauline way. It's the Pauline way of affirming without flattering. It's the Pauline way of encouraging without puffing up. And I know that seems weird. We don't naturally do that. But remember, Paul feels obligated to give God thanks for these Christians. And he calls us into this. We have an amazing opportunity not only to thank God, but to encourage each other for why we are thankful to God. And that's what Paul is calling us to do, to take our eyes off ourselves, even and to put them on each other, to encourage each other, thanking God for what he's doing in our lives. Lastly, the result Paul says, I'm not only thankful for you, Christians, I am bragging about you to others. He says, I'm boasting. I'm going around to churches all around town bragging about what God is doing in your life. Why? Because they had a hope that ran deep. This is the result. They had a hope that ran deep. They were uh, persevering through persecutions. They were enduring afflictions. Why? Because God was clearly at work in them. Faith and love, in, ch- in that first letter, faith and love were evidences of God's election of them. 
That's what Paul says. It's, it's evidence that God has chosen you because you have faith and love in your life. But in 2 Thessalonians, the increase of faith and the increase of love in their life were evidence that God was actively working and sustaining them. And that increase in love, that increase of faith, produced an enduring hope in their life. And Paul praised God for it. Remember, these guys were being persecuted mightily, more so than anything that we might ever experience in our culture. They were being persecuted greatly. They were being beaten. They were being threatened. Satan was beating up against the, the door of their hearts. But they clung to Christ. They were believing in Christ. They were praising Jesus. They were holding on to Jesus because Jesus was clearly holding on to them. And Paul says, I thank God for that. These Christians were not masochists. They didn't enjoy suffering. They didn't enjoy persecution. But because they remembered their own spiritual reality of what was true, they believed what God's word says. They were able to rejoice in their sufferings. They were able, as James says, to count it joy for the fruit in which God was producing in their life. They didn't give up in spite of the persecutions because even though their outer person was being destroyed, they knew that their inner person was being renewed day by day. They boasted in their weakness so that Christ's power may reside in them. They were trusting that his grace was more than sufficient. And so Paul gave thanks. Last Sunday was the day of international prayer for the persecuted church. And I can't help but remember uh, a couple of years ago, and they're still experiencing great persecution in China, but a couple of years ago, our missionary partners were really being persecuted. They were being beaten. Um, some of our pastor friends were being thrown in prison. Their email updates and those that their family sent us and their church members sent us, there was not a hint of resentment or anger towards God. In fact, their main prayer request was not that God would deliver them. Their main prayer request was that as they had the pleasure and the privilege of sharing in Christ's sufferings, that they would stand firm. They would be able to shine the light of Jesus and rejoice and give thanks in the hope that God offers them. It was the living embodiment of that statement, the noxious weed of discontentment does not grow easily in the soil of a thankful heart. I know a lot of us in here are probably going through seasons where it's hard for us to remember what to be thankful for. We might not feel very thankful. So I'm going to do a little exercise. I'm going to read Psalm 103. Psalm 103, which I'm sure was very much a part of Paul's heart, and I'm sure very much a part of the Thessalonians' heart as well. Psalm 103. Remember, this was written by David. David was a man who experienced great pain, great suffering, great turmoil, great adversity in his life, but this is what he wrote. Bless the Lord. Give thanks. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. He's cultivating that heart of thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He's counting his blessings. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As, as the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord 
is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord. Give thanks, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works and all places of his dominion. Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. For whatever we have or don't have, whatever it is we're going through, when we remember those blessings, count those blessings, we behold our God, behold our Savior, behold our status, we remember the benefits of the Lord, I promise you, our lives will be one unbroken hymn of thanksgiving. Brothers, remember the blessings that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ and be thankful. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're so undeserving of it. But in your love, you chose us. You set your, found, your, your love upon us before the foundation of the world to bring us into your family that we might be your children, heirs of you, co-heirs with Christ. Father, well that up within our hearts. Help us by your spirit to be grateful. And may we live a life pleasing to you. It is in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.